Thanks everyone for joining. Um, yeah, as uh, George just said, um, it would be the purpose of this is to make it interactive. So um, I've got a few gaps uh, in between different sections of the slides to um, to raise any questions or ask things that you have not understood in the process. Um, but yeah, this is supposed to be. A brief history of information centric networks, which I mean, we have discussed with most of you, has been a kind of a parallel um, research area involving academia, but not only. There are big, there were, there are big industries involved there, um, and there has been quite some work done there. So it would be, I think, very beneficial for people at you know working in uh, on IPFS and lib P2P to just get an idea of what has been done and then possibly uh, dive deeper in, I don't know, follow-up workshops or in-person meetings to see if, you know, there are interesting features that we could um, uh, adopt and uh, follow up on, on uh, in APFS and loop B2B. So, um, yeah, for, okay, for, for those that we have not met, my name is Yanis, I'm a lecturer at University College London and I'm a researcher uh, advisor at Protocol Labs, mainly working in areas related to uh, content routing, DHT, and things like that. Um, in fact, okay, uh, I have just started not that long ago, so um, yeah, probably we haven't interacted too much with many of you. Um, so I have been working at UCL since the beginning of 2010, and um, those last, all, all those years, the main point of work basically was information-centric networks and we have done quite a few works from um, ranging a long span from architectural, uh, from the architectural perspective, from caching perspective, from content delivery perspective, mobility, um, pretty much all sorts of things. Um, lately, we have been working on um, the distributed and decentralized edge computing, where um, what we've seen is that instead of addressing static content, we wanted to address uh, computation itself and be able to trigger basically computation through some uh, addressable um, structure. So there is this page there, which I have recently put together um, a story together with links to papers. Um, it might be an interesting read if you want to see what um, we think around here for the future of the network. So, um, in terms of the ICN of um, the ICN community, one place where someone could find interesting information is the IRTF group. So, um, the IRTF stands for Internet Research Task Force, which is the research branch of the Internet en Engineering Task Force, the IETF, where uh, most of the standards for uh, internet protocols are being developed. Um, so the IRTF is looking a little bit into more um, futuristic things maybe, or you know, uh, things that do not have space in the standards community yet, or you know, that, that's what the, um, the chairs of each group are a thing. So there, there are quite a few uh, interesting informational drafts there. Um, so uh, it's an important thing. It doesn't cover research, like pure research things. So it doesn't cover papers and things like that. Uh, but there are quite a few interesting internet drafts and informational RFCs that someone could get um, a good idea of where, you know, where, where the thinking uh, behind it is heading. Uh, so the IRTF, I mean, the ICNRG group is meeting with, together with every, you know, IETF, which is taking place three times a year. And sometimes there are interim meetings um, in between those meetings, uh, in between the main IETF meetings. Um, there is interesting discussion generally over the years. Um, the area also has uh, a conference, which is um, uh, sponsored by ACM. Uh, it's been, I don't know, it's been happening since 2011 or something. It started as a workshop together with uh, ACM SIGCOM, but then it became a conference. Uh, this year, year is taking place in Hong Kong in September. Um, there are going to be quite a few interesting papers there, so it might be something to keep an eye on. Um, those that can attend, can attend, but those that not, there, there are going to be some interesting papers um, out soon. 
Um, so, uh, what's the next slide? So, so okay, so that's roughly the, um, the outline of what I would like to talk about. There are three parts. So, I'm going to give a quick introduction to information-centric networks where, you know, the, the, a little bit more technical bits than what I have just said. Um, then there is the part two where I have selected three representative projects um, that had specific features which I think could be useful for IPFS and LibHP. I'm going to talk about each one of them for about 15 minutes and then we can have some discussion, you know, questions and answers. But yeah, feel free to interrupt, it doesn't matter, but it's just roughly what it's going to look like. And then there is a final part where I have some of my own thoughts and kind of design proposals for, um, for what I think so far, having looked a little bit deeper into IPFS and lib um, So it's, it's actually worth mentioning that terminology might be all over the place. So you might be, we might be saying the same thing in two different ways or using two different words. So uh, just feel free to, to interrupt basically and um, yeah, ask what is that or, you know, if it's termed differently in your dictionary uh, to avoid further um, confusion. So yeah, um, so what the motivation for ICN has been, hello? Um, the motivation for ICN has been pretty much the same as it is with as it has been with IPFS from the beginning. That the network is basically content agnostic and the content is location dependent. So this makes makes it a little bit stiff and difficult to you know think of the network as a native content distribution network. So. People have, you know, have come up with, you know, uh, observations and measurement studies to show that most of what of the applications that we use today need a native, very efficient content distribution network. But what we have instead is point-to-point -point connections, and this, in the long term, is not going to be um, very supportive of all the things that we have, want to do with the internet. So, by naming um, individual content objects what is happening is that we can have more security. Um, in some cases, there is better support for mobility, and there is also native support for multicast, or if not native, it can be achieved much easier. Uh, so that has been the starting point, which, I mean, I have heard many people from IPFS saying exactly the same thing, so I guess uh, um, we're quite aligned on that. Um, so people started talking, you know, what extra can we do with ICN, and this is, up to the present day, um, which is not exactly the right question to ask, in my opinion. So, you know, if we can do things in an easier way, then that's already a start. You know, uh, we can always do things, but if performance and the way we do it is suboptimal, then um, things will eventually become prohibitive. So some of the problems with IP, which I'm sure you know, is that you know if we want to cache some content, if we have some web content or whatever file we have, you know we can either cache or um, or authenticate. We cannot do. We can never do both. Um, effectively, we're securing the channel over which uh, content is transferred, and it's not the content itself that we're securing. Um, and effectively, users are asking for what. what well, the network is replying, who has got this what? Which is, I mean, it's a, it's a misunderstanding, it's a kind of mismatch. Um, an example I, I, I'm giving, some that I used to give actually back in the day was the warehouse versus high street retailer example, where um, if we think of content as a material good, what is happening today is that um, we always have to go to some back-end warehouse outside some big city in order to get what we want. Um, and what we should actually try to achieve is that, say, you know, popular things that many people want should be closer and we don't have, we should not travel that far, you know, to get a bottle of milk to go to shopping mall, massive shopping mall outside the city. So. In order to do that, we need to know what exactly we're looking for. So that's why we need name data. Um, and we need to have space to stock that stuff, to, 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 to have that stuff closer to us, which is basically caching. Um, and the main promise of 
ICN was that the network will be able to support in-network caching. Now, for which reasons, that's a bigger discussion, but there has always been the assumption that there is going to be support for in-network caching. Um, and then, of course, you need uh, resource management and trust and security mechanisms. So, what does an ICN architecture look like? So, we have name resolution, which is a fundamental part of any architecture. And we have to do a name to location mapping. So, we have a name and we need to map that to some location. And then, once we have that, we need to go and fetch the content we want. Now, depending on how early or how late in the resolution process, in the, in the name resolution process, this name to location mapping or binding is done, um, we can either achieve many of the uh, benefits I mentioned before, security, multicast, mobility, support for mobility, and uh, effectively a native content distribution network. Um, and, uh, you know, the later you do the binding, the binding between name and location, uh, the, the more you can, um, the more benefits you have. Now, there have been mainly two approaches. So one is the um, native data plane approach, which is what we can call name-based routing. Um, and this mainly supports uh, late binding. So what is happening there is that we assume that network routers, um, the actual network routers are, can talk this ICN language, can talk the protocol, understand the protocol stack. Uh, and therefore, they can receive and do routing and forwarding based on this name directly. Uh, so there has been one instantiation that mainly supports that, which is the name data networking project. And I'm going to give more details later. But um, the important point for here to uh, remember is that we have network routers that speak the language and therefore they receive a request and they can forward it um, natively, so you have a kind of hop to hop, hop by hop resolution. Um, and then we have the name resolution based or look up by name approaches, which um, there have been several projects there um, where this is kind of early binding. So at the beginning of the name resolution process, the end client is asking some external entity, where can I find this content? receives some location back in terms of IP address or similar or a peer ID or whatever and then goes and fetches the content. Um, now, depending on how efficient this can be done, you can achieve most of the benefits, but if you neglect and you just do this, you know, uh, early binding and then basically source routing, you're, you're missing many of the benefits. Now, there have been many projects there, um, mostly running in the European, like funded by the European Commission. Um, uh, which start from um, projects like, let me see, oh, look what I found recently, let me see. Uh, laser pointer, wow. <laughs> um, so, so there have been many projects starting from uh, 2000, 2009, 2010, and going up to this last ICN 2020 project is uh, one of the projects that we had uh, with UCL and many other uh, partners in Europe and Japan, which finished actually last month. Um, and of course, okay, we've got IPFS, uh, which is still ongoing, and not many of those projects are still ongoing uh, for good or bad reasons. So. Just a few a few points on naming. Naming is the kind of cornerstone of um, an ICN architecture, um, and there are many. It's a very big it's a very big topic area. But um, some of the fundamental requirements of names is that they should remain the same after the content moves. So if if you if someone takes the content and takes it to a different ISP, the name should remain the same in order to be able to to find it again. And it should they should allow for content caching. So that's something very important which you can't really have with you know IP networking because you know uh, all the cache or the network is seeing is an IP address and you don't know what the content behind it is. Whereas if you have a named content chunk or content object, this means that you can identify because you request this by name and therefore you can retrieve it from anywhere in the network. Um, now, okay, 
so naming itself is not really a problem, but if we want to have, you know, and naming should not be topology dependence. That's the location independence principle that um, ICN is building on top. Um, the problem is that root, routing is topology dependent. So in ICN, if you want to have addressing through naming, then this is, this is something very important to get right. And in ICN, basically naming determines routing. Now, um, to go a little bit further back, um, there is this famous quote by Yakov uh, Rechter, which sometimes is called the Rechter Rule, um, uh, which says that addressing can follow topology or topology can fo follow addressing. You have to choose one, um, which makes perfect sense if you think about it. I mean, th this is the main person that designed the BGP protocol, so um, uh, it's probably right what he's suggesting to do. <laughs> so in IP routing, what we have is, um, what's that? Yes, okay, uh, someone raised their hands, yeah. 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 Um, Hello. Yeah. Tell me. Hi. Uh, Hello. So a question about um, like what when people say naming and in this context, like what what do they mean? Is a name is a name an address? Is it uh, something that is you know mutable versus immutable? Is it something that's human readable versus machine readable? Like what is meant by name? Right. Um, so so good point. Um, Pretty much uh, all of the things that you said. So there are some approaches that say that initially started as saying, you know, um, naming should be human readable. Uh, but then these, of course, everyone realized that it doesn't need to be like that. Uh, it doesn't need to be um, human readable. The main distinction, the main two properties. So the main distinction distinctions over the years was whether a name is flat or there is some hierarchical structure into the name. So if you have a hierarchical structure, just like we have in a URL, then this can help a lot with aggregation in network routers as you do routing and forwarding. So this is something that is a kind of a positive um, um, feature of hierarchical routing. Now, what is in the hierarchy doesn't necessarily need to be human readable. It can be anything basically. And that's where we come to the flat uh, name spaces where you know many have proposed actually you know uh, hash based uh, addressing uh, where you know it's more difficult for routers to understand what to do with a piece of content but there needs to be you know if you have a name resolution system then you know um, you can route and forward accordingly the main property that all of those need to have is that the name should be unique right um, I don't know if this answers the whole question. So there are, there are some examples later on of what each architecture of those that I'm going to talk about have used. Um, but yeah, is this answering the question or should I? Maybe, well, maybe we can get, we can go to it uh, later when we see some of the examples, but cause you say unique, but it's like unique with respect to, to what? To uh, yeah, to, to every other name in the internet, just like you know, you have a hash based on the content of uh, of an object, and you want that because you want to identify this specific object by this name, right? Which applies whether it's to mutable or immutable data, because the mutable data will change, right? And so the the name is like not necessarily unique to the data; it's unique to like a flavor of the data. Right, so, so let's assume, I mean, for the most part, it has been assumed that content stays, um, stays static, at least the basic design. Of course, content itself might change, you know, the content of an object might change, and then there is a discussion over whether, you know, um, if it's a hash based thing, then that's fine because the hash is changing, but if it's not, and it's a name that is given by someone, then maybe it should be followed by, you know, version two of the name or something similar. Is that answering uh, at all anymore? Yeah, yeah, yeah helpful for me. Thanks. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Um, 
fine. So, um, yeah. Uh, so let's move on. This is uh, with regard to naming. I just had a small, you know, reference here. It's a it's a very big topic, um, but as I said, there, there are. are each architecture followed its own name naming scheme and naming structure. So we're going to to come back to naming um, soon. So uh, okay, uh, any other questions up until this point? Uh, we're going to get to part two now, where uh, there are some uh, other three projects that I mentioned. The first one is um, the named data networking project. Um, which uh, the, this has been initially designed and proposed back in uh, 2006. So it was kind of conceived by uh, Van Jacobson when he was at Xerox Park. And um, so Van Jacobson is the main person that basically designed the congestion control algorithms of TCP, uh, as you probably know. Um, so he was very interested for a long, long time on how can you, of course, okay, on congestion control and similar things, but also how can you achieve multicast? So he gave the first talk, uh, Google Tech Talk in 2006, which is a very interesting talk. I highly recommend it. It's a bit long, but it's certainly interesting. And then the first paper they published in uh, IECM Connect, which is um, rather big and uh, very good uh, conference in the networking space in 2009. Um, so at that point, it was mainly, you know, a project running within Xerox Park. Um, then for all sorts of reasons that is out of scope here, um, the, the project was kind of renamed and moved from Xerox Park to um, a bunch of academic uh, universities in, in the US. It was initially funded by the NSF. Um, and led by UCLA and Li Xiaozang as a PI, um, where they have a follow-up paper uh, in um, CCR, Computer Communication Review, in 2014. Um, the, the website is this one, and they've got um, a, a really a big, big collection of, of material from papers, presentations, videos, tutorials. Um, this is a very active project. It's still going. Um, there is an active test bed that exists and people uh, use to experiment with it. Um, so it, it's one basically together with another one that we're not talking about, going to talk about today that is still active. So what was proposed there was that um, the thin waste of the, of the protocol stack, instead of being an IP packet, it should become a content chunk. So I'm pretty sure you're very familiar with that because um, IPFS and LP2P try to do pretty much the same thing. Um, uh, now, where the IP goes is that it, it, it is kind of pushed down. Um, it's obviously not going to disappear. Um, initially, it was proposed as a clean slate network architecture where, um, you know, the IP protocol is going to be replaced or whatever. But, of course, that was not the intention is that uh, the same way as we don't necessarily use MAC addresses in order to route things over a wide area network. The same with IP it would become a lower layer protocol and on top of it, there would be named uh, named content chunks. So there, in this design, there are two mainly um, packet types. There is the interest packet and the data packet, um, where both of them, one basic component is the content name. So names, we're going to see in the next slide, but they're in, in this case, they are hierarchical and would look something like that if someone wanted to reach uh, my web page. Um, and they've got, um, okay, the, the, the data packet is signed and uh, there are some metadata signed to it such as uh, freshness period and things like that, kind of, you know, TTL and, and similar things. Um, and the important thing to note here is that um, the, the inter effectively, the interest packet and the data packet re resemble what we have today with IP packets and uh, acknowledgements, TCP acknowledgements. So uh, it's worth thinking a little bit about it that, you know, we have an interest packet which is about 30 bytes long or something very small anyway. And it's asking, there is it's a request and interest for some data that is going to be sent back. 
um, the, now the data packet is not a whole content object, but is about one kilobyte or so, right? So, so we're talking about some, you know, kind of pretty radical modification where, you know, today what you have is that you have an HTTP get at the application layer and then at the network layer, what is happening is that, uh, the sender is pushing data towards the receiver, is starting a connection through TCP, and after the seen ARC, uh, there is data that is coming, is kind of pushed back by um, uh, by the, the the TCP sender. Now here we have um, a kind of, and then and then upon receiving, you know, the data packets, the receiver is sending back acknowledgements to say that they received that. Now. It, it, to kind of get to where in the end is, is we, we need to kind of turn this on its head and say that the sender is sending first interest packets and upon receiving the interest packet, any sender is going to reply back with data. So it's kind of upside down and of course, you, uh, you understand that these would come together with some uh, congestion control algorithm that is directly applied on the named interest packet and the named data packet. Um, so, so names there uh, in this architecture are hierarchical, uh, as I just mentioned to Adin. This is one of the architectures that um, use hierarchical names. Uh, the, the parts of the name, they don't necessarily need to be um, human readable, it could be anything. Um, but there needs to be some hierarchy because routers in the middle of the network, what they do is that effectively they do longest prefix matching. And depending on you know what they know out of all this and where they can reach, they forward accordingly. So, for example, if you wanted to reach you know um, an academic institution in the UK from Australia, you would need to at least be able to know where to forward packets starting with UK slash right. Um, and the further the, the closer you get, people you know routers might know more. Uh, more parts of the name and therefore they can make more intelligent decisions. Now if someone has happened to download this before and there is an extra request for that then the router somewhere in a remote area far away might, might already know the whole of this so by doing longest prefix matching it can find that and retrieve it from closer so it doesn't have to come all the way to where this uh, content is originally stored. That could be either end users in the uh, end, end user devices, or it could be in network caches or, or whatever. So the more a content is becoming popular, the more the, the, the routers are getting to know the whole part of the name and therefore they can serve it naturally um, from closer. Now to achieve that, there are three tables in the main uh, NDN node architecture. The first one is the content store where uh, it is assumed that it's a cache memory uh, and that's where, okay, there, there has been a big debate whether everything that passes through a router should go in the cache or not. Uh, initially, I'll explain in a minute, but initially that was um, proposed in order to recover TCP or transport layer losses basically and not having to go all the way back to the sender to get what has been uh, what has been long, lost further down the path um, but then people you know build all sorts of uh, caching algorithms to make you know um, the whole network perform more efficiently so this is the content store then there is a pending interest table which is a table and index basically where every node is storing their interests that it has just forwarded further. And then when the data for the interest, the, the data is coming back to consume the interest and once it sees that, it's going to remove the name from this uh, pending interest table. And then there is the FIB table which is kind of similar to the FIB tables that routers have today where uh, of course, in, instead of having IP addresses, there, there are prefixes and, you know, as I said before, it depends how long the prefix that you have is, um, and you forward it out of some interface. Um, so, so that's the, the node structure that every router is supposed to have in this, uh, in this model. 
Um, and it's a very interesting structure. It, it brings lots of challenges, as I'm going to say in a minute, but um, uh, it still is an interesting um, design. So if we go to a more graphical um, explanation, we have the requester here. Um, we have a bunch of routers and the source node down there. So what is happening is that the requester is sending an interest bucket, which is going to reach the first router in the network. What this router does upon getting an interest is that they check first the cache to see if the content is there already. So if it is, they serve it directly back. If it's not, then they check the pending interest table. Uh, this is quite interesting because, as you can understand, you know, as, as interests are as are stored there, they can enable native multicast. So I'm, I'm going to explain that in a minute. Um, and if nothing is in the pit table, then they check their FIB and they forward accordingly. And the next router does the same. They, uh, they check the cache, the pitch, and if nothing is there, the FIB and forward further. Now, at some point, we reach the, content, the, the main content source, we, who is uh, in a cache or whatever memory they have. They get the content and send it back. Now, every router is caching the content locally, and the content is eventually returned to the requester. Um, now, when, when another request comes from someone else for the same content, obviously it's going to hit the cache and get the content back directly, which is improving the efficiency, of course. Um, but it's, it's also, it can enable, as I said, um, time-shifted multicast, because if we have, if the first requester is sending uh, an interest, which is stored in the pending interest table, if another requester is send it, sends, happens to send an interest for the same thing, this router is not going to forward the interest a second time. It's going to say, I'm expecting this content to come back, therefore um, I'm going to not forward this, and when I receive the content back, I'm just going to send it out of both interfaces. Um, so so the, the native multicast, uh, issue is very nicely uh, is very nicely covered here. Another thing that is covered is that um, there is support for mobility. So if we assume that these are not two different requesters, for example, and you're sending a request, but then you um, you disconnect from whatever access point is there, Wi-Fi or cell station, and you connect to another one, you don't have to tear down and get a new TCP connection done. You just send the interest, which, you know, um, the interest that you send this when you were connected here, the content has probably come back and is cached here. So even if you lost this due to uh, bad connection while you were transiting to the next to the next base station, what is happening is that you just send the interest again and you retrieve the content directly from the last hop in the network. So pretty pretty interesting design, which Okay, of course comes with challenges. Um, there, there, the two key features of this architecture is that, apart from the rest that I mentioned, is that they, uh, there is a connectionless model. So there is no connection establishment, basically. Users just issue interests, and there is data from data senders that go back and consume the interest. Um, and there is always a rather strict push-based model, so uh, sorry, pull-based model. So data is traveling in the network only if someone has requested it. So um, this has got several interesting properties carrying in, uh, carried together. Um, as I said, okay, yeah, it's an interest and data packet, which is the TCP connection basically upside down. Um, and of course, there are some challenges, right? So. S scaling the FIB size is an issue and it's not an easy one because we have to assume that you know you, you need to keep track of pretty much any namespace that exists in the internet right so uh, of course you don't need to keep track of the whole of the name as I said routers do longest prefix matching um, but even to keep you know the, the first few um, uh, the first few parts of the hierarchical name, it has been shown that the feed is going to explode. Um, and, the, and then there are patent cache poisoning attacks. So they, this is not a solved problem. Um, and uh, one that can, um, I mean, can be a showstopper at, 
don't know if it's the right word to say, but it's a problem that is looking for a solution basically because someone can um, issue interests for contents that uh, do not exist, for content that does not exist using random names. And this goes and fills up the pending interest table of uh, the routers effectively uh, launching a denial of service attack because you know nothing else can be stored in there. Um, and I think that's uh, right. So yeah, that, that's the last slide. As I said, there is uh, the project is ongoing. There is uh, uh, there is a live test bed that people are using mainly for research purposes. Um, it's the only proposal. It's pretty radical, but um, really nice design in my opinion. And it's the only one only proposal that you know does actually name based routing um, from the sender to the receiver. Um, or at least that, that is the main uh, design. Um, yeah, and with this, I would like to take a quick pause here and see, you know, if there are any interesting features that you think should be considered further in, uh, in the context of this project or uh, more generally or whatever. Any other question you have? So I would ask, um, you had mentioned that name-based routing and name resolution, uh, like look up by name type yep. architectures are the two different ways of going about this. Yep. Uh, how, as different architectures, how much overlap or similarity is there between the two? Uh, like, are there, are there problems that come up with NDN that you would expect IPF to, IPFS to see? Or are they disparate enough that you'd only expect to see it if we like started turning the course of the ship to overlap. Right. Yeah, that, that's actually a very good question because one suggestion that I had is that um, name-based routing, one interesting feature or, or um, uh, principle that it brings with it is that it can resolve local content. So in my view, a hybrid approach between you know having a name-based system up to some point and then some resolution entity that is going to try and find what local name-based routing cannot find, uh, I think it can hit the, um, strike the right balance. <coughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, but up until now, that's a very good point that both approaches have taken either one or the other. And my view is that a combination of these two, uh, and, and both of them have problems, scalability problems or performance problems, we're going to see later. Um, but having a hybrid of the two um, has not really been looked at. And I think it's a very, practically, it's a very interesting direction that someone should consider. Yeah. Um, okay, hello, can someone, Nate, yep, hello. Oh, I had a quick question about, um, oh, I'm sorry, if there are two people speaking, um, just, just about, uh, if I, since I'm speaking, anyway, the um, hierarchy of names, is that allocated by some authority, or is there, you know, how, how does that get resolved? Yeah, yeah, good point. Um, yes, there is, it is assumed that there is going to be something similar to the icon uh, that we have today. Um, that where the, you know there should be some central registry for uh, names or not every name obviously not every document that we produce and publish uh, every day needs to be um, uh, needs to be registered but up to some point the hierarchy to get the prefix it, it will need to be agreed between everyone yeah That was the same question I had. It just sounded like the name-based routing was the same as DNS, and I guess that is the case. Okay, uh, can you repeat? I didn't hear very well. Oh, sorry. I had the same question, okay. um, just about how exactly the the name-based routing. You know, how they knew where to, you know, where the next server was supposed to be. And it sounds like it's very similar to D how DNS works. Right. So, so, um, so, the, so there are a few issues here. You don't necessarily need to know where exactly the server is, but there needs to be some bootstrapping, some bootstrapping in the network, right? So, um, because initially, so in day one, how how do you get actually 
the first entries in the FIB table. So this would have to be done by some static um, uh, link state routing protocol that would need to run to bootstrap basically what is put in the FIB tables. And then, yeah. Um, so you see, I saw that uh, Steve Ben uh, raised a hand. Uh, yeah, so I, as far as I can tell, a key difference between this and DNS is that with DNS, like I ask one server for the name and they tell me where to go to X and then they keep on doing this recursively. With this, it's more like I would ask one server, then they would forward, then they would forward, then forward, and eventually like some caching server, hopefully, or maybe the final destination will forward back the content. So it's, exactly. it's more that it's like, uh, it's a forwarding system instead of like a recursive lookup system. Yeah, 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 exactly, absolutely, yeah. No. Right, is it, is it my turn? I was using the chat to raise my hand. I don't know if that's the, that's the right approach. Uh, so I have two questions here for you, Yanis. Um, interest cancellation, how does, um, how does a node signal to the rest of the network that they have received the chunk that they were interested in? So I'm assuming that the chunk doesn't travel backwards from the same path as it was advertised to the network as that interest was advertised to the network this would i don't know if is that the case because that yeah yeah it is yeah yeah oh it is all right yeah yeah, yeah. So, so yeah i forgot to mention but that's a good point yeah uh, so so there is symmetric routing that is assumed here mm -hmm. so you can take so the return path has to be the same and this mm -hmm. is basically um because uh, as a requester is sending some interest mm -hmm kind of um, installing some state in this PIT there. Uh, and then through the FIB, you know, it says that I have received interest for this uh, name, where, and when it comes back, I have to send it out through this interface. So it's not going to send it back through another interface. Got it, yeah. So this effectively uh, creates a single path for this request on the network, because uh, it would be very difficult to parallelize, right? Because at the end of the day, like if, if you parallelize and you take multiple paths, you'd end up flooding the network with that demand in a way. Uh, and with the, with, with the data transfer that that demand generates, right? Or exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. In the, in the, in the initial, in the base design, you know, single path and symmetric routing is assumed. Uh, and, and then, you know, um, other protocols would have to build on top if you wanted to do some sort of multi-path and take mm -hmm. advantage of, you know, several different paths along. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and is there, is there any, anything being considered um, for resiliency and for redundancy? Because if one of these nodes goes down, uh, then the path would be broken, right? Right. Yes. So, so, so the main premise here is that, you know, if, so it depends, if this node goes down, then this requester will have, so, so, no, sorry. If this node say goes down, then this router would, because they've got the FIB table that interconnects, basically everyone knows who is around, they can, they can forward the request to someone else. So that is not a big problem. Obviously, whatever is ongoing is going to be lost. Okay? Mm. But then the network is going, resiliency is something that can be supported by uh, by. Got this. it. So yeah. this persistent overlay in, in a way would kind of like, re, uh, like reform it with a different path. Uh, when, yep. okay, whoever is directly connected to that node notices that that node has, is, has become unavailable. Yes, exactly. exactly. Got it. The, the second question I had is uh, you mentioned a, a hard limit of one kilobyte, I think, on chunks. Uh, how does the network deal with larger chunks and files that are larger than that or composites of chunks? Right. So there would need to be, I mean, hard limit. Yes, it would have to be. There hasn't been any hard limit. And I think what they're currently using is about four kilobytes or something. Um, is this is this? I mean, has not been. I don't think it has been agreed or standardized at this point. Uh, everything that is larger would have to go through fragmentation, basically, as it happens today as well with jumbo frames and things like that. Mm, got it. So at the end of the day, it would be kind of like the file itself, or 
the chunk that makes sense to the user uh, to fetch in a single unit the one that's addressable. You wouldn't make the inner blocks of that larger blob addressable in themselves, right? So I didn't get that. So imagine you have a one megabyte file. Uh, it would be the one megabyte file that has an address. Uh, it wouldn't like it's not. There's no chunk. There's no addressing of the inner chunks that that one megabyte ah. file would be composed of. Uh, yeah, or yeah, the that, fragments, as you call them. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, 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 there is going to be an individual name for each individual chunk. Um, so, so the long name could be, so say, this one is not an HTML file, but is a huge PDF file. The huge PDF file of one megabyte is going to split in chunks of one kilobyte or four or five or whatever. And, okay, there should be some naming convention that would say this would be x.pdf chunk one, chunk two, and there would be some sequence number there where you know we're talking about chunk number one, similar to the sequence number in in TCP packets. Got it. Thanks. Yeah. No. Okay. Um, so if yeah, if we don't have any other questions, I think we can move. Yes. So the name based um, uh, routing approach, or uh, a small part of that, together with some other hybrid, is something I think that could be quite interesting um, for to consider in IPFS. Um, so the second part now, the, the second project um, is a, a project. Actually, it's a paper called Donna Data Oriented Network Architecture. It has never. It has not been a project. It was a paper published in two thousand seven or six in um, ACM Sicum. Um, and because so, so in terms of timing, it was so early. It was basically behind before you know the um, uh, the NDN or CCN uh, project from Park and Van Jacobson. So that's why it was very timely and it created lots of interest around it. Um, and I, I don't know the paper has got some thousands of citations just because it was so timely. Um, so the main motivation was the same, you know, uh, content is what matters and not exactly who is uh, hosting the content. Um, it was supposed to be a clean slate design of the internet um, with main design goals, having uh, persistence, names need to remain when content moves to another domain or another location, uh, availability, which means that access uh, should be reliable and fast, and then um, authenticity, which, you know, through some uh, mechanics, it need, we need to be sure that what we're getting is what we ask for and what the sender uh, is claiming to be sending. So the naming in Donna uh, comes in uh, PL, which um, actually doesn't mean protocol labs for a change. <laughs> it, it comes in P, principle, and label. Um, so you can think of principle as uh, it, it, it's a pretty central concept around uh, Donna architecture. And you can think of the principle as the, basically the network, uh, sorry, the content publisher or someone who is caching or storing the content. Um, and in practical terms, what this P is, is the cryptographic hash of the uh, public key of the content publisher or whoever is storing the content. And then there is L, which is a label which is chosen by the principal and again has to be unique. So it can be the hash or something, but it has to be unique as compared to any other content in the internet. So it has to somehow you know, be uniquely identified with some bits in this uh, content object. Um, the packet format is uh, of this type. There is a data, public key, and signature. And uh, the clients obviously verify data by comparing uh, the hash of the public key what the, with what the principal or the content publisher has provided before. Um, now, there is an, uh, the other very central thing in the donor architecture is the resolution handler. It's a, it's a network entity. Uh, kind of thing, which is placed inside the network and inside the ISP's network in order to handle requests and redirect, do the routing and forwarding, basically. So 
the main operations is a register packet. So you can think of that as publish. So you have a content you want to register in the network and say that I have this content here and if anyone is asking for it, come find me. Um, and the find, which is basically seeing what state has been installed in, in the resolution handlers by register messages in order to forward the requests accordingly. Um, okay. Ah, please. Something. Okay. Uh, anyone had a question or? No? Okay. So the register process goes something like this. So um, there is a resolution handler, which is pretty much, you know, you, you assume that there is at least one in every ISP domain and um, that whoever has got a copy of some content is needs to register with the local resolution handler. Now what the resolution handler is doing is that he's propagating upwards in the IESP hierarchy or any peering domain they have um, to say that I have I know how to find these contents with this uh, with this PL name. Um, and this goes all the way up to the top level uh, tier one ISP or uh, top level entity. Uh, and therefore, and, and that's done in order to be able to actually then find the content where if there is a client that is asking for this copy of the content that we just registered and published from that resolution handler, what happens is that it's going to hit that one. This guy doesn't know where to find it. He's going to forward it upwards. This guy has seen that there has been state installed in this resolution handler before. So they're going to forward down and go and find the copy. So, so this figure here is not exactly accurate because I think I'm pretty sure um, in the donor architecture there has there have been uh, there were peering um, messages as well. So this guy here would register the messages to this guy and this guy. Therefore, this could be cut shorter and be forwarded between these two resolution handlers to go and find the content. But that's the general idea. Um, so um, there is okay. There, there is some optimization we did in one project we had, which was called curling. Um, so in a more, uh, it's basically an optimization in several terms in in the state kept in in routers. Um, but what is happening there is that effectively you have requesters that are sending a fine message, and then uh, the resolution handler is going to route towards where if it doesn't know if, if there is nothing in the cache, then um, they're going to forward it upwards in the hierarchy until uh, it finds a top level domain where it, it needs to go further down again and find the content. Um, so yeah, th this is a new entity, a uh, new entity there, the resolution handler. Uh, it's an interesting architecture, obviously, as you can uh, understand, stress in terms state that needs to be kept top level domain and you still okay. a message that unstable that's why I'm asking. I think your connection stuttered for um, a little so bit. So we did okay okay now You're breaking up quite a bit. Uh, um, um, exactly what I have. To... Oh, okay. So we just lost Yanis. Hopefully, for a second. Yes. Okay. So he's back. Janice, you are currently muted. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear now? Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. Sorry about Fair that. Enough. Yeah. No. Uh, pretty bad. Pretty bad. Add your own for you. <laughs> All right. You need to resume screen sharing. All right. Great. I'll yeah. unmute again. Okay. Right. Um, so, um, 
so we did the study. So uh, I don't know if I was uh, off by the time I was saying that. What I was trying to say is that, um, as you understand, the, the top level resolution handler is going to experience uh, a lot of stress in terms of the state that it needs to keep. Right, because every effectively every single content piece of the inter on the internet needs to be registered there, right, in order to be able to to eventually go back and find it. Um, so the we did the study a few years ago to try and uh, approximate how uh, how how much state actually needs to be uh, kept in uh, ISPs given some hierarchy. Um, so we did that for Donna and for the optimization, we did curling. Uh, you can see here that, okay, these starts from small uh, ISPs and uh, from subdomains basically, and then for small ISPs. But as you, as you go along to find the tier one ISP, you see that they need to keep all the content in the universe. Uh, and that's pretty similar, even though the optimization for we did in curling where the Top level domains don't necessarily need to keep all of the content, but they need to keep most of the content. Uh, the situation is a little bit better for large and uh, small ISPs. Now, assuming uh, um, uh, 10 to the power of 13 information objects published in the internet, what this translates to, that's quite interesting, is this is the number of servers that tier one domains need to keep in order to have the state stored. So this is like 26,016 um, gigabyte RAM servers in order to be able to store everything um, in, in, their, uh, in their memory and be able to do um, to forward requests accordingly. Now, uh, in summary, um, okay, uh, effectively what it comes down to is that you have resolution handlers and each resolution handler needs to keep routing state for data that is below um, the most stress goes to tier one isps as we said um, so the initial design was claiming to be doing name based routing but this depends on how many resolution handlers you actually have per domain so if you have just one then it's not quite name based routing it's just a different resolution system if the more resolution handlers you have, the, the more you can actually do effectively what you try to do is, you know, um, take advantage of local connections and forward requests locally and avoid stressing the rest of the network as you go up. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, that, that concludes the, the, the second part. And um, yeah, any questions or interesting features? For me, for example, something that could would be interesting to have as a network, and in this particular case, the IEPFS network grows, is to see if there is, um, if we could, uh, have a notion of hierarchical, you know, domain or a uh, autonomous system structure. Um, this, of course, doesn't need to be, you know, uh, related to the ISP itself, as is in the donor architecture. Um, but having some sort of structure is going to help with scalability, but both with performance when, you know, the content is basically uh, resolved and sent back from the center to the receiver. Um, any other ideas or questions? Or ha ha has this been discussed before, the, the structure in terms of... Uh, uh, um, some sort of uh, domain-like thing? No, no, I'm hearing no. So some, that's something to consider then. Yeah, I've, I've had thoughts along this line in terms of like how to so organize collaborative pinning. So like friends that pin their other friends' content and then ah. if, if, you, if you somehow knew that that content was available from your friends, you could just go straight there as opposed to just going to the DHT. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, that, that uh, doesn't take into account uh, any topological structure, does it? So if you're in Canada and I'm here, but we're friends, I'm still going to come straight to you and get it, right? Um, 
yeah, I mean, you could have like friends that are ge geographically located together. And right. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of so I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I think some topological embedding of uh, some structure uh, um, with some name based routing would, I mean, uh, it would resolve local content locally, um, which would improve performance quite a bit. Um, yeah. Yeah. Hello. Hi, Stephen. Ah, right, Adin, or I don't know, whoever. Uh, yeah, go uh, on. Can you show, are there any, like, so what do the names look like in this system again, in order to encompass both, like, the, the signature identifier, but also the hierarchy? Right, so the hierarchy here does not come in terms of names. So this is how the names look like. It's just uh, uh, the uh, PL structure where the principle is basically the cryptographic hash of the public key of the person that is storing the content or publishing the content. Um, and L is something that, again, has to be unique. So I would have thought it could be the hash of the content, basically, which is unique to this specific uh, content object. Um, yeah. So there is no hierarchy here. It's more of a flat kind of uh, structure in the name. Uh, in terms of hierarchical structures, that would actually be, I think, really interesting for IPFS. One concern there is like you generally, whenever you have a hierarchical structure, you kind of implicitly have um, uh, authorities, uh, which is something we tend to shy away from. The nice thing about IPNS is like, like there's no authority. You just like have your key and you have your your namespace. Uh, can, you, can you repeat because it, it was it was cut in. Uh, I didn't I didn't oh, hold of it. Right. So in the beginning you said hierarchy. Yeah, so in IPS, we currently don't have hierarchies primarily because that requires a namespace or a name authority, um, as far as I know. Uh, we probably wouldn't want it to be uh, location based uh, simply because then, like, one of the key goals is to be able to like, move and still have your content resolved. Uh, but you can still do hierarchical namespaces without making it necessarily map to geography uh, by just like updating the, like, I guess the next layer up and saying, hey, I moved over here. Um, and then, yeah, but yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, yeah, so, so it makes sense. Uh, so, so I agree that uh, putting the hierarchy in the namespace can be, um, I mean, it can be useful and that's something that could be considered. It can be dangerous because, so the problem there is that the, the naming structure and the topology of the network are two different things that are kind of moving and uh, evolving in parallel and they can go into totally different directions <laughs> and then you end up with some structure that is not following the topology at all which, which is kind of already almost happening with ipv4 but it's going to be even more so with ipv6 so it, it, it's kind of dangerous and i agree with that on the other hand um you, so topological doesn't need to be, um, you know, um, yeah, sorry. Uh, no, sorry, I'm just trying to clear the hand, never mind. Ah, okay, uh, so, so topological doesn't need, to, doesn't need to necessarily mean that if we say that this content is here, it cannot move elsewhere. It does not need, I don't think, to say to be inside the name. If we have an, in, you know, if there is an index somewhere that says within this, area, metropolitan area, you can find these contents, then this will be much faster when you try to deliver the content basically on the opposite direction, right? Because, you know, um, so I think some topological embedding needs to happen, but of course I totally agree that it should not be restricting in terms of um, the naming and what happens when we later want to move the name, the content to a different. So uh, the way we deal with this now is like uh, you have, well, that's, that's why we have content routing. But like content routing will say like, hey, in here are the places where you can find the content. Uh, ideally, like we'd have additional information here, but like uh, content routing could be scoped to like where you are, uh, and that would I think help solve this because then like you would like automatically find people nearby before you find people further away. Okay. Uh, but in general, like the, the problem is like putting this in the name or putting top or like location based stuff in the name itself. Yeah, uh, just like you, you end up with this big problem. Yeah, the, the, the yeah, standard yeah, problem. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, no, no, I was, I was not meaning put any location thing in the name. So, so um, okay. my, so, sorry, yeah, probably it was not expressed correctly. Um, but the hierarchy here um, does not, this does, didn't mean to say that it, the name has to be location independent. And this thing, I was not meaning to put it in the name. So uh, it's just if the network like uh, through uh, through some uh, gateway or some similar structure like the resolution handler can keep track of what content is local, right, we, without inserting that in the name structure, could, I think, resolve content locally and improve performance. It basically comes down to what we said before when Evan asked the hybrid of name-based and name-resolution-based. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, Jim, yep. I can hear you. Sorry. Yeah. Um, the, these are all interesting schemes. Um, there seems to be a tension that, that I haven't really heard talk about with uh, privacy. So, like, your uh -huh. the router you're talking to knows everything that you're accessing on the internet. Absolutely. And what 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 um, what what does the community have solutions for, for that? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's an excellent point, actually. So, so the good thing um, about that is that the router inside the network, if if you use some name-based routing, the router, a random router in the network, doesn't know who, where is this going to, because there is no IP address. You're just following back, and you're sending based, basically named content. And through the state that is installed in every router, it's going to come back to who, whoever is requesting that. So in that respect, it's better than what it is today. Now, the problem is the first hop, so because the first hop can see everything that you're requesting, basically. And you've got state installed that is pointing back to you. Uh, so in that respect, there is uh, there is an open issue there. There, there have been some um, there have been some approaches, but I have um, it's been some years. But yeah, yeah, that's a good point. There, but it is in the radar of the community, and there have been a few uh, a few approaches to the, to, to solve that. Yep. Hello, Adin. Yeah. So I guess a, a thought here is is the the hierarchy that here maybe feels reminiscent of like cord in the sense that if I can depend on everyone being up, right, I can create the hierarchy of just being like how many bits in I go and I like right. jump all over the network. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It could be, it could be something similar. Although yeah, uh, I can not remember all the details, but cord has got some very nice features. The thing is that, you know, because it is, Ultimately, a DHT table, um, you know, th this is becoming suboptimal because once you, you have to go into the DHT, you might have to travel far away. And therefore, the latency of doing that and sending back the answer could increase. But, but per ISP, right? Like, if each yeah. ISP has to have its own set of resolution handlers, you're basically running like a little mini DHT thing inside of each ISP network and then accessing them. Yeah, okay, yes and no. In this particular case, in the donor thing, it was um, an index-like thing. So you didn't have to, to go and run the DHT, but alternative approaches, yeah, could, could have a DHT, which you, 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 you again have to go around the, uh, the ring and find what you're looking for, but assuming that this is kind of topologically embedded in the same region, you don't have to f travel far away. Yep. Yep. Any other question? Okay. So, right. So the last uh, project is the um, NetInf project or Network of Information. Um, and that is actually the result, has been the result of two uh, consecutive EU projects, which started from roughly 2009 up until roughly 2015. Um, it, it's been, uh, this project, what has this been designed there is very, very similar to IPFS and lib P2P. Um, and um, it's very interesting that they kind of both have been 
designed around about the same time, but in completely uh, independent paths. So, so the sale project is worth mentioning that it was uh, quite big and had a bunch of companies. If you go to the website, uh, there are all the big companies have been contributing um, or somehow been involved in, in the project. Um, so what is happening in, in this architecture is if uh, you have a request or and uh, there is a name resolution system that is using. So this is the name resolution based uh, uh, architecture where on the first step you resolve your, the, the name that you're asking for to the name resolution service and then this gives you back the locators and you go and get the data that, um, that you ask for. Uh, there's supposed to be caches there, so if something is cached because you're getting you're, you're asking for something based on the specific name of the content, then you can take it from mid part of the network. Um, or it could be that some parts of the content you're looking for is in this node, and some other parts are uh, down here in the other node. So you're going to split the requests and try to get data from uh, from many uh, different. Um, uh, nodes. Now, the, the NRS system, the main thing that was uh, developed in the um, NetInf project is a DHT system, a multi-level DHT scheme, which um, I think the minimum is three levels, but it could be more. I think they experimented with more, at least uh, theoretically. Um, and if we go a little bit further down into more detail, if we assume that there is a, an object X, which is uh, the host of which is TK, then another node, we have this netinf domain, or it could be an autonomous domain, uh, and the DHT associated with the autonomous, uh, the autonomous system, and then you have the pop level DHTs. Um, the request is going through some access node, is reach, reaching the DHT of this, uh, of, of the pop level, and it's going to go further up to the uh, to the higher layer DHT if that pop doesn't if that DHT doesn't see where the actual content is is stored locally, and then it's going to go down and go and find. I mean, it's pretty similar to uh, what uh, IPFS is doing, but at at at, at the multi level. And then the content, of course, is going to follow the fastest way back. Um, it, it's worth mentioning that these access nodes, they're, uh, access nodes, they're not doing something. They're not actually um, keeping any record of what has been stored. So I suspect that if there is a user here and asks for exactly the same object X, then you know, unless some node there has a cache, the same thing has to happen again. So you know, what I'm saying is that if there is a node somewhere here that does some keeps an index of, of things that have been forwarded recently towards other users and other hosts, then this will ev eventually you know, forward the request and, and the content um, in, in local nodes. So the naming scheme, I guess it, it looks quite similar to what you have seen before. <laughs> um, so there is the NI, uh, there is an authority part here, which is the content publisher, but the, this part is optional. And the main is uh, uh, whether what kind of digest algorithm is used and then the value, where the value they use the, the hash. So effectively is very similar to um, to, to what is being used in IPFS, or at least the, the, um, the initial uh, CID of version zero or whatever it was uh, before. Uh, they published an RFC where they are discussing some interesting things when that, and interesting features that someone has to keep in mind when uh, naming things with hashes, uh, which is, um, can be found there. Um, Yes, so the interesting, uh, there are, they, they have some uh, papers where they build a, a pretty simple simulator uh, in order to see what is the benefit when you have a multi-level DHT system. Uh, so this goes like they, the, the assumptions there is that there are, okay, several millions of nodes, they assumed, propagation delays about 200,000 kilometers per second, um, and these are the delays that they assumed for 
those sorts of distances, which is, of course, a simulator. I mean, it's not it's not quite the same. It's not, it's not quite like that in the internet. Um, there, there is, of course, no nuts uh, traversing or things that are extra delay. So what we're going to see in the next slides is basically the trend and what it looked like. It's not really realistic. I mean, I would probably put these these values here multiplied by two or something that would be a little bit more. So yeah, so, so here what we see is on the y-axis is the latency to retrieve some content. So to request, go and find it and send back the, uh, uh, the object that I'm asking for. Um, and this is the number of nodes in the network, which it seems it doesn't make any very big difference. Now the different lines here, that's the interesting point, uh, they, they're comparing a multi-level DHT, which is the um, MDHT here, and SkipNet. Um, so SkipNet, I don't know, it's an old paper uh, which was called, uh, I can't remember what, what the title was, but effectively um, is sharding the namespace in order to not go and ask every node in the network, but depending on the sharding that you have done, you go and ask those nodes only. Uh, it's, it seems to be pretty uh, efficient in what is reported here, but as I just said before in to Stephen's uh, um, comments, that's a little bit dangerous to do. So if you, if you um, add kind of topological things inside a name and you shard the namespace, especially in terms of hash-based names, uh, then as the topology evolves, these two things could become quite far away from each other and different to what it was supposed to be. Now, okay, so, so let's, let's focus on the dashed lines. This one, this one line there is saying uh, what happens if we try to resolve content if we have one DHT. And as you go up, you see what happens if you have three layers, five layers, seven layers, and nine layers. Now, it is shown here that the multi-level DHD is having worse performance than the single-level level DHD. Um, but this is for uniform request distribution. Now, if we go to that side, uh, where it is assumed that we've got a 30% level probability, or, I mean, this effectively says that 30% of requests can be um, are local to some DHT to some uh, to the DHT itself, which is topologically embedded into some geographic area, then this becomes much. So, so the one level is not shown here because it's supposed to be one thousand, which is somewhere up there. But what we can see is that with nine levels of DHT, you can reach performance which is much much below what it was before and then you go as you go further up you see uh, this is for three level DHD, five level DHD, uh, seven level DHD etc etc. So we, this actually is shown here uh, a little bit better. Uh, here we have again the latency and here we have the level probability. So, so how likely is it that consecutive users they're going to ask for something that has been requested before and it's within some geographical region, um, you know, uh, uh, the locality of interest effectively. Now what we see here is that the single level DHD is, is up to that point. Uh, and here we have um, the multi-level DHDs, which is starting from nine, from the nine level, uh, let me see, seven levels, five levels and three levels. And we see that up to, when we reach 20% of, um, of similarity in terms of content distribution in the network, these can go, I mean, the more levels you have, the more efficient the thing becomes. Um, of course, it's never going to be, you know, anywhere close to 0 0.8 or anything, but there has been studies that show that the zip exponent of uh, um, a zip distribution can be something between 0 0.8 and 1.2. Um, so, okay, so a value around this area, I would say, that is reasonable to assume. And therefore, this shows that the locality of interest can bring massive benefits if we design the system as such that is taking these things into account. 
Um, right. So the summary of that, um, it's very, it's a, it's very, very similar to what uh, IPFS is uh, today and liquid to be. Uh, the difference is that having one DHT is becoming, you know, it, it, it's suboptimal in terms of where you have to go in order to resolve content, and you, you know, there is no notion effectively of having, you know, resolving getting content closer if someone else near you have it you know okay that, that's not exactly what happened in ipfs and i know that there are caching nodes and things like that um but effectively you know a more hier hierarchical structure or multi-level structure can bring uh, more benefits um so yeah uh, a quick pause here before yeah uh, the interesting feature in my view is the um the different levels of the DHD that have been supported there. Any other thoughts or previous discussions on whether anything like that makes sense, either in terms of topological embedding or in terms of topic level or... Yeah, Molly and Adin, yeah, yeah. I'm curious if there's been any studies of um, like populations of internet requests and how much overlap there is in a topological region um, because that that seemingly makes a very large difference. So it'd be interesting to analyze how much overlap there actually tends to be within a locality to understand where current network practice falls on that graph. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. There, there, there are studies. Uh, there, there are old studies and newer studies, but people have been trying to find out, you know, how, what is a reasonable percentage to, 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 to assume there in or, as we build networks and optimize networks, uh, what is reasonable to assume. So it's worth looking into those, yeah. Yeah, uh, so two, two questions. One is, so this is all dealing with immutable content, right? Yep. Okay. Um, the other is from from what I remember, although it's, it's been a little while, the like even before like Kademlia and such were were published, there were thoughts like, well, yeah, let's let's try and have like embed the topology more into the system. Uh, and Kademlia was sort of like, eh, this is hard. What if we just make it random? Um, mostly because actually like finding the topologies when you're not doing like the ISP thing and like just dictating them from the top down is, is sort of difficult. Like, I don't know, like if this, the multi-level DHT was that run in practice or mostly just simulations? Um, so the, the, there was a test bed. Uh, I don't know how global it was. Um, I can I can find out, but there, there is there is code that is available, and there was a system that was actually built and not only simulated. Yeah, certainly there was code there. I don't know how much stress tested was, but stress tested, but uh, there was yeah. Yeah, because when you start dealing with like people who have like like weird like as yeah sort of asymmetric connections and and NATs and all of that like the figuring out like where actually everyone is to help build the optimal topologies can become difficult. Yeah. 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 Uh, keeping a note to have a look at the code and what they produced. Uh, okay. Yeah. I've seen some other, uh, so I think Steven or Raul or both. Uh, for context on the P2P, uh, the P2P DHT, was supposed to originally have a uh, multi-level DHT using uh, Coral, which just guesses the levels based on latency. Uh, so like multiple people would all work together and sort of like collaboratively figure out that they happen to be in some low latency group. And then that, mm -hmm. that's how the levels are formed. Uh, this was just never implemented. Okay, okay. So th there is plan to get these, I mean, to, to, for this to be the okay. main part at some point or? Eventually, yes. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. And and do you think the Corral design is the kind of uh, optimal one in order to try and capture things like locality of interest and neighborhood effect or whatever, whatever we call it? 
I don't know if there's a better system currently. That I, I, I think it, it, there, there may be some room for like a, a hybrid system that uses like your local, like your literal local network as like the, the bottom tier. And then maybe you can automatically configure a certain IP range for like the next tier. Or you could even use like your local ISP's information. Right. Uh, but then beyond that, actual latencies are usually the most correct, I guess. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, anyone else? Yeah, so I had, a, I had a question. Have there been, so I think most of this would be applied or would be deployed at the ISP level, right? So there would be kind of like some prearranged uh, deals or relationships with a, an implicit trust, you know, relationship between parties and so on. Yep. Have, there, have there been any, any, any research into how these concepts could be extrapolated to peer-to-peer to -peer networks where, that are inherently trustless and need to model for Byzantine, you know, uh, faults and so on? Yeah, I know, I know a project, I think it's called IPFS and Lib B2P. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So, so maybe, uh, maybe I forgot to mention in the beginning that all these, first of all, they, uh, they were proposed as um, kind of not replacements, but the next level of what the internet protocol stack should look like. So it, they were supposed to be able to address and deliver the whole of the content in the whole of the internet and you know like for everything just like ip does today so um it was quite risky projects and you know um, not blue sky but you know towards you know let's do something quite radical um yeah so that that's one thing and the second is that yes there was in all of them there is the involvement of the isp to uh, some extent um but for example, the resolution handler uh, was supposed to be one in every ISP. I don't know if it would need to have the agreement, but I guess from a business model perspective, someone would have to get this machine and go and put it there, connect it to everyone, you know. So who would kind of foot the bill for that? Therefore, the ISP is the most you know, straightforward thing to approach and go and put it there. Um, so yeah, yeah. So I have seen there is some discussion. If we want to take this trust out of the ISP or the ISP out of the picture as to how we build a system, a peer-to-peer -peer system where this is not involved or we do not blindly trust the ISP or whoever is the infrastructure provider, then of course what comes in is, in my opinion, the incentives. And I have been, I have seen some discussions on, on GitHub that you know. Incentives should not only be around for storage and you know for, for that kind of thing, but even for routing, providing routing information and routing hints. The if you remove trust, someone has to replace that. So how do you do that? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, and then ah right. So I I put some resources here where. Some people might, you know, we might want to look at uh, later. Uh, there is a hybrid ICN approach, which is also an active project, and it might be worth looking at. Uh, it's being currently developed at Cisco, so it's not a dead project. It was not done at some point. It's an open source project uh, at Cisco. Where what is happening there, what they're doing is that they're assigning, they're addressing content chunks or content item, items with an IPv6 address. So every item gets an IPv6, uh, IPv6 address on, it, on its own, and that's how they kind of, they, they also have the interest in data packets, and the sizes are pretty much the same. It's just that it, the, the naming is quite different, and um, it's a really interesting thing worth keep, keeping an eye on. The, the code is open source, so just this link there. Um, currently, I think it's only Cisco people in Paris that are developing this um, and I, actually we're colleagues we're, we're working on the same project together uh, but I have they have just released a new uh, version of what they're doing um, and then in in simulation tools on top of what Molly uh, suggested about measurements and you know trying to find out measurements another thing that I think would be 
interesting is to try and find simulation tools. So um, we have, for example, the Icaro simulator, which is basically a caching simulator. Um, we have released it, I mean, it, it's been years and it has uh, uh, got some visibility. Um, the main person that developed that, they then moved and I know that they have been using the simulator within Fastly. Uh, so, so it's being developed and uh, maintained, and it is something that could, you know, get data as input and project what then the performance is going to be like as an output. So, before doing releases, I, I know Raul is is uh, working on that and is very interested. Uh, so, I mean, some of that could be uh, there is the NS3 the Docker emulator for NS3. Uh, network simulation version 3. So what we have actually done here is uh, you get a Docker version of some release of Go IPFS, say, and you put it into the NS3 simulator, then whatever the script or the network topology you want to run, uh, NS3 is, is very big and, you know, simulator with many, many features. So you can get a pretty realistic topology based on production code, uh, no, not topology performance based on production code. So uh, that, that could be something interesting to, to, to look at in this case. Um, yeah, so, so there are some, yeah, some thoughts that I mainly, I mean, I, I mostly talked about those, um, but the main thing is, you know, uh, the, the main outcome of this, discussion should be, you know, what could we borrow? Is there something interesting that deserves further thinking before, you know, allocating resources like big resources? You know, I think we should have and could have, um, you know, either follow up online discussions or physical, a physical meeting where, you know, we kind of pick a few things out of what we discussed today um, and see, you know, what we could take into account. So in my view, uh, as I said, some topological embedding of some structure or some nodes is going to improve performance considerably, whether this is done through the coral techniques or uh, some other technique, I don't know. But I think as the system moves and, you know, the, the delivery delay is going to start becoming an issue. Maybe not now, maybe in five years, but you know, if the system is supposed to be a kind of content delivery network, the CDN kind of approach, these guys have done crazy things. And in order to, to get even close to that performance, you know, um, some topological thing needs to be in the whole system, not necessarily in the naming, I'm not, I'm not saying that but um, in the system. Um, so this can come in terms of some name-based some uh, name based uh, routing as opposed to only name resolution based routing. So some node that can keep track of what is being cached locally and redirect to local nodes when something gets popular before getting, before hitting the DHT. I think that is also something that can take huge advantage of locality of interest. Um, and then as we just said, routing and trust basically. So, so how do you do that? All, all the above have assumed that there is an ISP, we put a box there with some software and does that and we trust that it does that. So if we remove the trust, something else needs to be in, in place for that. Um, yeah. Yeah, Jim, yeah. So uh, one sort of low-hanging fruit thing I was thinking for the name-based stuff is we actually do do some name-based stuff in IPNS. Right. That you can you can use a, a a DNS name and then that gets resolved um, to an IPNS key, which then is used to look up in the DHT. Um, but like we're not we're just sort of using that in the resolution process for DH, uh, DNS lookup and then throwing it away. But what if we didn't throw that away, we actually use that. Um, I, I'm sure Dean has um, some thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I saw this somewhere and uh, that's the next thing I want to, to look at more closely into IPNS and there is a thread of the, 
uh, DNS link, the TXT, the TXT there, um, which could stay for a bit longer or could have some other metadata information that it can be kept or help in some different way. But yeah, good point. Um, um, the, the, the one point with that is like we're 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 not using those IPNS lookups very often. Like they're just, it's just like the the what is usually used for websites only. Yeah. Um, so we're not because it's mutable. We want to have immutability. So it's, yeah. It's a, yeah. Cool. Yeah. 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 Agreed. Yeah. Um. So yeah, so I put some thoughts here on the, 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 there are mainly three parts to the lifetime of the content. So one is the content publishing and there is this huge discussion on how do you provide, how do you do provide the records? Uh, how do you publish basically and register content? Then there is the content storage, which is okay, the five coin storage market. And then there needs to be, I believe, I, I, I don't know, but eventually needs to be timely delivery as well. So, so content needs to be, provided back with some SLAs and some guarantees um, um, to keep uh, uh, call the service high. So in terms of content publishing, it's the, there is something that's uh, discussed briefly with Stephen at some point last week or the week before, which is that in my opinion, caching is different to storage. So it's different to say that someone is storing something and that is going to be there for longer time periods and you know, it's going to become unavailable, you know, if electricity goes out and it's different to having someone that is caching and is unreliable, unstable because they just close the laptop and go. Um, so I think this needs to be reflected in some um, uh, node class kind of thing where there are some caching nodes which are unstable, there are some caching nodes which are stable and then there are nodes that actually store content. And in order to get that, um, you know, there, there needs to be techniques that actually uh, both measure the participation of nodes in the network and therefore kind of assign them or build a reputation of some sort uh, and, you know, be, are allocated in one of those categories. Um, and then how do we actually do the provide the records that, that you know, I have this content cached here is a whole different thing. And th there are interesting techniques there to see, you know, to, to estimate basically on when did some node started caching this and how much time has, has it been since then. Uh, try to probabilistically infer whether some piece of content is still in this cache or it has expired and it's out, it has been pushed out of the cache. Therefore, you know, we can assume without having to provide, to send out, provide the records all the time, we can, um, we can probabilistically know whether to uh, contact some node or not. Um, uh, then is content storage, which, uh, you know, it has to be reliable and available and it needs basically smart replication. So the content placement needs to be intelligent so that, you know, when I receive some content here, um, other, I, we need to have a mechanism to, to see whether it makes sense to replicate this content to other nodes that are close by because, you know, I might disappear from the network, but this content might become uh, popular all of a sudden. Therefore, it would be good to have it somewhere close by and be able to identify it as such in order to serve other content, other users, you know, without having to go up to the DHT and have to resolve the content all, all from the start again. Um, and then, of course, you know, content delivery is uh, another tricky point, but I guess that's on the plan. This is a little bit further out towards the future. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so a kind of a design proposal is that, uh, which I'm sure I have seen some of that in GitHub pages and just thought of putting it in one uh, or two slides is that um, not every client should be, uh, should be providing uh, routing information. There should be one gateway node or entry node or a few, I don't know, which we trust first somehow and then these are sitting before the DHT so that we can um, uh, resolve content that is local. Um, and 
effectively through a multi then a multi layer DHT approach is obviously providing um, pointers to services rather than static content, which kind kind of comes down to this terrible figure that I put together. Terrible. <laughs> Um, but if uh, the, the main point is that if you have clients here and you have this local gateway or whatever other thing we want to call it, you know, uh, if it keeps, if this gateway here is keeping an index of what other clients have, then a request could be resolved locally without even hitting the local DHT, which is there. Then if something is not there, obviously you need to go to the DHT and maybe different levels of DHTs, but you know, having one node that is basically attached to several different DHT rings, this makes, you know, latency to be pointed to different levels here or there minimal. You don't have to go to the other side of the planet in order to get a pointer to the DHT that you need to go. So physically, this is one machine that is just keeping indexes to different things. And down here is you know it's not keeping it's keeping an index as in a table not before it goes into um the the, the dhd so a structure like this i think could you know in the long term uh be something that should be considered um and of course it's the issue of trust right so so we, I'm, I'm not forgetting that it's just uh um yeah um, yeah and of course the design i think depends on the desired outcomes you know it, if it's a faster, if we want IPFS and LPP2P to be a faster CDN network, then, you know, there needs to be a lot of work. As I said, you know, CDN systems are, are crazy sophisticated. Um, if it's a permanent, you know, storage and backup network, then, you know, with a DHT of one or a few of some sort, then I think the target is there and it's, it's totally fine. And, yeah, you might have noticed I have not, uh, mentioned the word security and privacy too much, <laughs> but um, the, this, of course, is something that needs to be there, uh, and and there is related work on that. And I, I know other people in in uh, Protocol Labs have been working on that. Uh, it's just I decided, you know, to keep it out of that and subject to a different meeting if we want to. Um, and actually, yes, if you fell asleep, I don't know. It's time to wake up now. <laughs> Yeah, and any other questions and uh, uh, feedback? There is this feedback form that um, George will send uh, or has sent already. I don't know, um, but yeah, um, any 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 kind of feedback now or later? Yeah, David. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for this great workshop. I really enjoyed like just revisiting a lot of these concepts, like reminding me of uh, a lot of things, but I was like learning new things. Uh, thank you so much for organizing this. I, I, I hope that this becomes a habit rather than just like a one-time event. Absolutely. Um, there is interest. Yes, yes. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, I have a bunch of thoughts. Uh, the, the one uh, that I will choose to like just bring up is, um, and like you were kind of like touching it at the end. Like it seems to me that like in both of these communities, either IPFS, Swask, with Peer, and also the name data networking, or even like the DHT research, yeah. um, there's kind of like this um, belief or this hope to find a one size fits all DHT, even if it's a multi-layer or like a, a clustering DHT, it doesn't matter. Like, like it, it seems like we are always treating like store, storage of data as like a, a database problem. When in reality is like a, a data access slash slash data publishing problem, right? Like um, I see something missing here, and and I was hoping maybe like you you know of some work or may, maybe like I, I it's already done and I just don't know about it, which is like how can we tell like when we create the data, how can we describe with the data itself like how it is supposed to be accessed? So I think like a blog, maybe there's like a blog post every week, so like users should not be like resolving each records every second because they they probably will not get or or um, as a user that wants to access some data i want to access the data but i want my access to that data to be private so i want to pick different kinds of mechanisms that enable me to do that given the resource type available um is, is there like any work towards this direction or um Right. Uh, so, so this is uh, pretty close to some thoughts I had myself in the past. But um, 
um, not, not in the very distant past, actually, uh, where all that is, you know, every piece of content comes together with some um, metadata. Mm -hmm. And these are, you know, if it's a blog post which is updated every minute, then this, this and that. If it's my web page that is updated every year, then this, this and that. If it's even going further and saying this is some piece of personal information out of my wearable devices that I want to keep totally private and totally encrypted and give access only to my doctor and no one else, not even my family or whoever, mm -hmm. um, then this needs to have totally different properties, right? Uh, yeah. So, so I totally agree with you. I uh, I am not uh, straight off on top of my head aware of an architecture that supports that. Um, but there have been recently approaches where um, you know you kind of attach metadata to data, and that's how you can achieve a few things. How scalable this is to address the whole of the internet, I'm not very sure. Uh, but I agree it's a, it's a very nice direction for, for, for someone to, to look at. I, I really wonder if this is a problem that could only be solved by like using AI, like ML and so on. Because like what we are talking is like about so many variables and so many options that you will actually need some help like to actually choose the right path uh, in which like you would publish something or you would access something yeah um, yeah cool um so is it okay jim has a hand then i'll yeah. raise my hand yeah. after jim again <laughs> <laughs> go ahead jim this is sort of a separate question but um uh, there's been a lot of this research and like and i've been following things like multicast which have been around since the 80s and never really took off and i feel like some of these things, it's just like um, the, the technologies are more efficient or the ideas are more efficient, but they're incompatible with existing business models like ISPs tend to sell oversubscribed. They don't put storage or squid caches in or anything to improve the experience. The experience is improved by CDNs, which have a separate business model where the publisher pays or companies like Google. So it, the, the, the current environment favors massive, massive companies like Google and Amazon. And so there's not, not much incentive, or there's no, not much profit to be made for at the ISP levels to like put, put in like more expensive Cisco routers and things like that. So right, I mean, it, it, yes, I agree. It's a very big discussion and it's mainly a business thing. Um, so um, ISP could do much more. Uh, one problem with with all that is that it's not only about putting storage, but it, it becoming an issue of trust again, because the content providers, they want to know how many clicks they got for their content, right? And they don't necessarily trust the ISP that they're going to provide the record to say you had that many clicks at this time of day, at this time of year. Right, and even if you trust your local ISP or whatever, you do not necessarily trust some ISP that is 10,000 miles away. Right, so, so there has been this thing with uh, accountability, basically, where caching has been a big thing, but it has not taken off as much as it could. And then there was a big CDN company that came and everyone trusted, and that's why they give the content to, um, uh, to them. Now, with with Structures like, you know, permanent names and name data, this is much easier to do, right? B because you can, you can have some proof that something has been requested and has been forwarded. And if someone is asking for that name, he's asking for that name and this cannot change, you know, and you don't need any DPI or anything that you can do, you know, under the hood, basically. But I, I totally agree. So it's a business model issue and yeah. Yeah, uh, David, I think is uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, um, I have one more question around like just the the scale of these test beds and their uh, like their availability. Um, how easy it is to like understand and and test like all of these projects um, from your experience. Like, what is the 
that friction that exists for, for example, if we were to like try some of these projects just for ourselves or like try to check in onto their test bed so that we could see the stats and compare it. Like if we were to develop blue peer peer benchmarks that compare to some of these uh, projects uh, in terms of like resolution and so on, yeah. um, how available are those, uh, if available at all? So, so there are many, so out of those that I have talked about, uh, it's mainly the NDN project that is uh, kind of alive and there is a test bed and everything. Uh, so that can be used, it can be compared, it can be measured. They are very open to any new user or any new collaboration or any new testing. Um, so I know, so, so on that side, yes, everything good. Um, so the NetInf project, for example, it's not operational anymore. I know there was a prototype. I know there was a test bed of some sort, and there is open source code available, certainly. But I don't think it's maintained anymore. But the, the fact that we can get the code and deploy it somewhere and test, that can be done. Uh, I'm, I have a note on this, so I'm going to, to check um, with them and see where is the code actually, uh, yeah. And as I said, the donor thing was, uh, the donor architecture was a paper. So there might be some code with the papers in some GitHub or repository, but it was never really, you know, it has never grown as big project. Yeah. Yeah, Raul, yeah. Yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to mention to add to David's thoughts of how much of this can we actually evaluate, reuse potentially, you know, that like, I think there's a fundamental difference between what these, projects are trying to address and the kind of the, 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 the lay of the land that they're actually seeing that is addressable versus what we are trying to do. We are inherently peer to peer, right? So these projects are actually assuming that the internet will be, will be reshaped and it will require active collaboration by very powerful actors out there. So I think the, like, it's, it's great that that's very grand mission. I think, uh, like I would, in order to stay practical, I would say let's try to understand the pieces of these projects, particular, you know, like problem solutions, tightly scoped solutions for particular problem domains that they've actually, you know, deployed or proposed or modeled or simulated or whatever, and trying to use those as inspiration versus actually trying to, you know, replicate or even consider for like, even consider at that deeper level because what we're trying to do is fundamentally different, right? Yep. Yep. But in, in order to stay like super practical, it's like let's dice and, and slice these projects apart, understand the, the, the guts of them, understand which parts we could get inspiration from and potentially use that as input to our research processes. Yep. Yep, I agree. Yeah, I don't know. This uh, is all based on like a two hour <laughs> presentation. So I mean, it's, <laughs> by no means uh, am I trying to like, you know, set direction or anything. It's just the way that I'm personally thinking about this. Yeah, yeah. I think um, there was Adin and David, I think you raised your hand. Or? Well, let me just quickly step in before. Uh, guys, please continue the discussion. But in case you haven't seen the, the link to the feedback form in the chat, it is there. And we would appreciate it if you could answer it. Uh, right away at the end of the call. But for yeah. now, I think Kadin was next, yes. Okay. Yeah, so um, just thinking a little bit about, you were saying about multi-level DHT stuff and what David was saying about some like, you know, uh, machine learning type of approach to maybe help map these things out. And I guess it makes me think of like sort of the, you know, mathematicians only know like three numbers. There's zero, one, and more than one. <laughs> um, and, and, and so like when you have, if it's like a fixed number of like the, if the multi levels are like fixed as opposed to like, a sort of this, I don't know, continues like this spectrum of like growing, um, those are like two very different ways of looking at it in the sense, the continuous, like the continuously growing DHT is basically just one system. Whereas a multi-level is like you've intentionally designed it as multiple levels. Um, sort of do, does the multiple levels thing as being like discrete, like what, what do you think are the advantages there? Um, 
So the advantages there, I think, is that you basically, when you when you enter this ring, in order, to, the next point that you're pointed to might be too far away. Apart, apart from net, nuts and things like that, even this can be very far away. So the the time to go there and then go to the next and then go to the next until you hit the point where you have the local node, you know, you, you get the node that knows where your content, the, the content that you're looking at is, can be both long in terms of the resolution, like to go around the ring, and then the node that you're going to end up to might also be too far away and that's when the, 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 um, the content delivery starts, right? Which has to go through a possibly long, you know, long haul path from a different continent. So if there is a more, um, a, a smaller notion of a DHT, which is registering local content, then, you know, the locality of interest comes together and it can be exploited, you know, by looking for content within the same metropolitan area, rather than having to go all the way to Japan to come back and find that the content is here. If you see what I mean. But can't you do that with like, like, uh, far, like far jumps? Right, so there's like extensions on, on cord where instead of just reaching all the way across the network, uh, in, in key space, you also reach to like people that are closer to you and sort of, you break the network up into halves and quarters and eighths. Yeah. So you could do that with latency and be like, well, I'm going to fill up most of my table with people nearby and I'll fill up some with people far away. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, it, it could be done. I have to, I really have to have a closer look into the coral. Uh, design because it's been some years since I last read the I mean the details of how this is done um, but I I know from people yeah yeah okay okay yeah that, that's a point yeah yeah uh, Raul had uh, a question yeah no okay uh, anyone else I can't see everyone uh, I'm unable to raise my hand Okay. Yep. But I did have a quick question. It seems like caching and like redoing a lot of um, the network to be more uh, name data network like or like information centric network like seems to violate the end to end principle in some ways. The what, which principle? The end to end principle. Right. Yep. How does that conflict manifest? in discussions around these projects and like within the ITF or like within big groups that have a lot of control over the internet. It seems like this is like, is this acknowledged as like, it could be really interesting as like a small, like as a possible alternative in the way distant future, but we're not gonna think about it. Do people tend to just dismiss this effort? Or do people generally agree that like, this would be a good thing but it has to be problems. Yeah, yeah. So, so there is uh, there is discussion lately to say that you know there is enough consolidation of internet services and that's not good, uh, and things have to change. Uh, there has there hasn't been any great movements. I mean, there are some people uh, some people that were talking about that ten years ago in the ITF or in some conferences, but there hasn't been anything. Um, fundamentally actually done um, so uh, yeah the discussion I think is starting now and um, we need to see how these new protocol stacks how you know um, content addressable systems can help with that or not help with that in some cases yeah and <clears throat> would you say that the reason why the conversation is starting now is that there, like, is it does it seem like it's tied to business type app? Like, who pays for these sorts of things? Is it that businesses are more interested, or there's like a clear financial incentive, or is there some other reason? 
I don't know. I don't know. Just people waking up to the privacy issue, and it, it's been around time. <laughs> it's been about time. Yeah, but yeah, I, I would. I mean, I, I have tried to talk about these things for years and years with people, but it was all always coming, you know, a secondary thing, and people looking to improve performance and this and that. And you know, you end up with solutions like VPN, and you're saying, okay. I don't care if there's more delay, I want some privacy. So, which throws away all the performance things that someone tried to do away because I don't care, you know, like uh, it's not only me. <laughs> yeah. Steven? I'd actually say this helps improve the intent principle because like uh, currently in order to have the intent principle in like uh, HTTP, we've had to layer on HTTPS that just absolutely prevents any and all caching. Yeah, but this is effectively like the endpoint is actually like the next router, and then their endpoint is the next router. So point to point, it's still like you probably have encrypted or secure connections, uh, but like you don't really care about which endpoint you're picking. I guess it's the best way of putting it. Uh, in terms of privacy, you can you can get privacy this is with encryption, but yeah, there, there's still like there's you can get some privacy there, uh, but yeah, you still have problems with like content routing and the fact that intermediaries will get to know what you're looking for, which kind of sucks. Yeah, yeah, agreed, yeah. Yeah, and you need those things, I mean, especially because, some, not sometimes, uh, you know, in all those cases, names have to be unique and permanent. Um, this means that, you know, routers or whoever is the forwarding entity uh, knows exact, exactly what you're forwarding. Right, so in terms of network neutrality and all that stuff, you know, basically information is out in the real. Um, you know, uh, you don't even have to do the packet inspection in order to actually see what's in that packet, um, which is another thing. Uh, I don't know that concerns me a little bit, but. Yeah. All right. Any more thoughts and questions? And uh, um, okay, there's lots of chat there. Uh, okay, yeah. So uh, there was this uh, uh, survey form. Would be nice to get some feedback. Um, yeah, uh, but if no one else has any question, then um, we can keep it to that. Yeah, thank I'm, you. I think we're at time. So, uh, well, thank you so much, Yanis. This was really great. And thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, and again, we really care about feedback. So, you know, if you want to use the next two minutes, it's a, it's a short form. Uh, and this will also help us plan, you know, future workshops, uh, either remote or in person. Uh, and yeah, I mean, that's it. Have a great weekend. Yeah. Thanks everyone for coming. I uh, hope you found it useful. Any feedback or anything that you think would be worth checking for uh, whatever reason, just drop me a line. <laughs>